This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. I want to share a message with you this morning that is, uh, it's a message that's been on my heart to share with you for a number of months now, to be quite honest with you, at least the last two months. It's been a couple of months back now, but there was a period of about two weeks' time where there were six different families in our church that were going through some difficult things a couple of months back. A couple of those were physical, serious physical things. But there were four different families in our church that were going through some difficult things that were not related to physical needs. During that particular two to three week period of time, there were multiple people in our church that came to me, both members and non-members that were visitors, who shared with me that um, almost the same thing going on in their life spiritually. That Satan was attacking them and, and, uh, and their family because of things in the past. To be honest with you, there are also some Families that are in our church that are members or non-members that aren't even here today. They really need to be here today. Some of them that this message would be a great blessing to if they heard it. But they're not here this morning. God already knew they weren't going to be here this morning. In fact, I'll be honest with you, as a pastor, some of the ones I hoped the most would be here aren't here this morning. But you're here this morning. And it's no accident that you're here this morning. You're here this morning and God already knew you were going to be here this morning when He laid this message on my heart. Not only to begin preparing several months ago, but this past Monday when He put this exact message on my heart for today. I didn't know who would be here and who wouldn't be here today. But God knew. He foreknew that, Miss Mary. So I have to believe that the message he's laid on my heart for today is one that is for those of us that are here, and hopefully for those that will listen to it later on when we put it online, that I wish had been here this morning. But it's a message of hope. A message of spiritual hope. No matter what is in the past, it's a message of spiritual hope. I hope you'll listen carefully. To all the things that I share this morning, I think it'll be a blessing if you do. But it'll require some active effort on your part to get all that God has for you this morning. If you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's Word as I read our text this morning found in Joel chapter number 1, beginning with the first four verses of the message. Now, Joel is an Old Testament prophet. He's preaching to the people of Israel, God's chosen people. But he's talking about the judgments of God upon them because of their sin in the past. Listen to what he said. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear. All ye inhabitants of the land, hath this been in your days or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten, and that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Turn over with me, if you would, to chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. 
he continues and he says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. And turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Friends, I want to bring a message to you from the words that were spoken by the prophet Joel. It was a message for Israel, but it is also still true, a message for God's people today. He began what we call the book of Joel. It's the sermon of Joel, to be quite honest. By talking about the fact that for years upon years, one year after another, God had allowed plagues of insects to come in and eat the good of the land. Every year the people went out and they planted their, their crops, their fields. And every year when it was about time to harvest the crops, one wave of insects would come in, devour a good portion of what was there. And by the time that wave of insects moved on, another type of insect moved in. Four waves of insects came in year after year after year and devoured their crops to the point that there were Israelites who literally starved to death and didn't make it. It was bad. It was awfully bad. If there's anyone who's here today who was alive or had parents or grandparents alive during the Great Depression or during the Dust Bowl way back in the early 20th century. Maybe you've heard the stories of people that were so destitute, so desperate, that there was not even food for their own family. There were many families in America during the Great Depression that even though the mom and the dad were still alive, the children were sent off to orphanages because they literally couldn't feed their own children. It was even worse in Israel. But Joel tells them that the reason for the plagues of insects was because of the sins in their lives. The sins that they had committed all the way back in the past and all the way up to the present. They were not just random sins that Cain got repented of and then were taken care of. They were sins that had become habitual. They had become a commonplace thing. They had become routine and part of their everyday lives. Not as individuals, but even as an entire nation. You already know the stories from the Old Testament about the idolatry into which Israel fell. Time and time again falling away from God, away from the God of this book, and the things they knew were right, and following after other things. Strange gods, the Bible calls them. Joel says all these plagues are because of your sins. They're because of the sins of the nation of Israel. But then he gives the formula. How to deal with the problem. And it's the same solution that God gives to us today. And not only is there a solution. I'm so glad that God not only gives a solution, a solution to the problem that we created. But then he gives a message of hope. At the end of the sermon. I'd like to share that message with you this morning. Oh dear God. We come to you this morning as a needy people. Lord, every single person who's here today and every single family who's here today is needy in some way. Oh, dear God, we depend upon you for our very existence. And Lord, we know there have been times in our lives, every one of us, Lord, when we failed you, when we've let you down, 
But Lord, it's not our desire to stay in that place. Lord, it's a desire to be restored. And Lord, even to have the hope and the promise that you offered through the prophet Joel. Oh, dear God, I pray that every person listening to this message would be encouraged by the message today, the message of hope, that they would claim it for themselves and that we would follow the instructions you've given us that we might receive those promises. All these things we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And you may be seated. It was a dark time in Israel's history, just as there were many times similar in Israel's history, where they had fallen into this pattern of falling away from God, worshiping other gods and goddesses, sometimes even statues. At times they even offered their own children as child sacrifices to the god Moloch. Not a pretty picture for God's chosen people. And yet I submit to you today that there are many Christians who are living the example of Israel out in their own lives. People who are saved people. They know that if they die today, they go to heaven. They could tell you how to go to heaven. But sometime in the past, they got away from God... And they didn't just get away from God and come right back, but they got away from God and they stayed away from God. Such was the case with Israel. Getting away from God is something that can happen almost too easily if we're not careful. If we're not vigilant. It can happen, quite honestly, before we even realize it's happened. But the greatest danger is not just getting away from God, but it's getting away from God and then staying there. Joel is bringing a message to a people that had been away from God for quite some time. But he tells them what to do to fix the problem. And he says, if you're tired of the locusts eating everything in your lives, there's a solution to it. We read the solution, and we're going to look at it again this morning. But I want you to stay tuned for the very end of the message. Because it's the message at the end of the message that's the greatest part of the message. But we've got to get there. He starts with the problem that the locust came in, and the caterpillar, and the canker worm. And they devoured the crops that the people had planted. In an agrarian society, if the crop is a total waste at the end of the year, you're in trouble. Because not only is your food for your family for the ne next year gone, but so too is any chance to sell anything and have the money you need to buy things besides food gone. It was an awful situation. But so too is it in the life of Christians. As a pastor, there are so many times that people want counseling for one thing or another, and the things that they're wanting counseling for are because there are things that they are losing in their Christian life. And it's a sad thing, but a a fact of reality. That oftentimes our eyes aren't open to the things that are wrong until we realize we're missing out on some things that ought to be there. Such was the case with the people of Israel. I don't think it even occurred to them that they really ought to be worshiping God until finally enough years piled up that they said, you know what? This is getting old. And it's a shame that sometimes it takes in our Christian lives getting to a point that the same things happen over and over and it seems like we just are ready to throw our hands up because things are not any different. That we finally stop and realize, hey, 
maybe they're this way for a reason. Now last week I brought a message from the book of Job, and if you weren't here, please go back and listen to that once the preacher gets it online. Because the trials that were brought into Job's life had nothing to do with anything Job had done wrong at all. Satan was tempting him. God was testing his faith. But Job hadn't done anything to deserve any of the things that were going on in his life. So I want to start to, today by saying it's possible that there are things going on in our Christian lives not because we've done anything wrong. That is honestly the case at times in our Christian lives. But I don't know about you. I only know about me. And I'll tell you honestly, looking at my own life, most of the time when there are things that have been falling apart in my life or going wrong in my life, most of the time it was not because I was like Job and didn't do anything to bring it about. Most of the time in my life, when God has had to chasten me, and things seem to be falling apart, coming apart at the seams, the wheels falling off, so to speak, most of the time it's because of me. Just being honest with you. If the preacher can be honest this morning, maybe you can too. But that's the preacher's experience. There might not be a plague of bugs come into your yard or into your garden, but I suppose in the 21st century there are some other ways that plagues of locusts show up in our lives sometimes. I've had families over the last six months that have come to me and said, it doesn't matter what we do, there's never enough money to pay the bills each month. I've had families that have come to me and said, listen, um, I don't know what to do with this or that the child or grandchild in the family. There are families that have come and said, our, our relationship together, it, it doesn't seem to be what it used to be. Preacher, what's wrong? I'm going to tell you, starting out, you might be in Job's situation. It might not be that you've done anything wrong. It might be that you just need to keep being faithful to God. And then walk out the other side and see what God did for you. But it might be that you're a lot like this preacher. And it might be that you might need to stop and say, Okay, Lord, why does the plague of locusts keep showing up every day? Why does it keep showing up every month? Lord, why does the plague of locusts keep showing up, flying in on the horizon? I did several years ago some research, Brother Alex, about the plagues of locusts there in that part of the world. Did you know that even today there are times when plagues of locusts will show up, even in modern times, and the locusts will be so thick in the sky that they literally blot out the sun? And it's like, uh, it's like an eclipse taking place. It becomes dark in the middle of the day. Now, folks, that's a lot of bugs flying around. Let me just be honest. That's a lot of bugs. But can you imagine if you made your living off of growing things and that showed up? Boy, that'd be devastating. Some of those locusts, they're in the millions and millions strong when they fly in. And once they get up into the, you know, locusts have wings. They fly. You've seen probably some grasshoppers flying around your yard with wings. Well, locusts can fly. They can get up pretty high. And once they get up into, I guess, the jet stream or they get up high enough into the winds that are blowing up there, it is not unusual for flocks, plagues, whatever you want to call them, of locusts to literally travel over a hundred miles up in the air before they descend down to whatever target they find. They can literally travel over a hundred miles in the air before they come down. 
That's kind of scary to think about them just dropping out of nowhere. But that's what they're able to do. And sometimes in our Christian lives, it seems like that's what happens. They just drop out of nowhere. But once they show up, they don't go away. They just hang around. One plague of locusts after another. I knew a man growing up. He was a young man like I was. He grew up in church, had a Christian family. He was active in our youth group. When we graduated high school, he went off to college. Even though he grew up in a Christian home and a good church, an active youth group, loved God, once he went away to college, he did what all too many people do. He got distracted from the things that are easy distractions in college. Having a good time. But he did well in school. He went on to get a job with a successful company and had a successful career for a number of years. Married a good girl, had a family with children, but he never had time for God. Because it just kind of happened over a period of time, he didn't seem to notice it. He didn't seem to notice the changes in him or in his family. They went to church occasionally, but church wasn't a priority. Things seemed to go well for quite a few years, but then problems began to surface with their children as they were getting older as well. Then there were problems with his wife. Then there were problems with his job that to be honest with you, was probably the thing that he thought was the most stable part of his life. Even his job began to have problems. And I remember him giving a testimony one day that he finally one day realized way back, all the way back to his college years, he stopped living the Christian life he had lived all of his life growing up and gradually, God became less and less a part of his life. He realized he had left God out of most of it. He ended up repenting, surrendering his life to God, and began to serve the Lord faithfully in church, and even his family got all brought back together. Today, as far as I know, he's still serving God as a layman in some church. But you know, I, I think from the story in the sermon of Joel here, one of Satan's favorite attacks, one of his favorite tactics is to tell people, listen, not today, you've got plenty of time to serve God. Don't worry about serving Him now, you've got plenty of time. I know that's what that man would have said about his own testimony. And I've known many Christians that I grew up with, that I was in the same youth group with, or went to school with, that they reached a point at some time or another in their life as a Christian, and they said, you know what? I want to please God, but, you know, I can kind of set it over here on the side. For a little while. But the problem is that too often in our lives, if we take our devotion to God, whatever form, and we set it over to the side, there's always the danger that it will stay sitting there. That we forget to come back and pick it up. And God's desire is that we never sit it over on the shelf. But how many Christians do you know that you know from growing up or you know from your past 
That at one time they lived for God, they served God, but at some point, living for God just stopped being quite as important to them as it had been. And even you and those around them could see it. Maybe even better than they saw it. Usually, their church attendance starts dropping off. Then the crowd that they hang around with starts to change just a little bit and slowly over time. The things they used to do for God, talking for God, speaking to people about the Lord, uh, that doesn't come into the conversation so much anymore. And eventually they reach the point that they're just like every other family trying to make the extra money so they can have this or that toy or this or that hobby or this or that home and the priorities change. And they start listening to the same things that everybody else at work listens to. Watching the same shows that everybody else at work talks, uh, talks about around the water cooler. But if they don't, they, they don't have anything to talk about because they don't know what the latest is. They don't know what's going on in the end thing. And more and more they become just like the world around us. You've known Christians like that. I've known Christians like that. And if you and I aren't careful, we'll become just like that. Satan's tactic, I think his, maybe his number one tactic is to say, don't worry about serving God today. You've got plenty of time to do that later on when you get a little older. You've got some other things you need to get on with in life right now. But then we find eventually, he says when it should be that time, then he says, oh, it's too late. You've already wasted too much of your time, too much of your life. You couldn't have what you could have had. You've waited too late. God couldn't possibly use you the way He would have used you. Just quit. You've spent too much time away from God. You've just missed out. That's what he says when you get to that point. Why? Because he doesn't want us to have any of the good things God wants us to have. He doesn't want us ever serving God. So he'll use one tactic to derail us, get us off track today. And 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the road, he'll change what he says to the exact opposite and say, well, it's too late. You're too far gone. You've wasted too much. You can't get it back. Too bad. You might as well enjoy the other things in life. And I think Satan uses that second tactic to keep so many Christians from coming back to God. And in reality, friends, it doesn't matter if we've been away from Him a little bit of time or if we've been away from Him for years or even decades of our lives. God wants us to come back to Him. The Bible tells us over and over that He's long-suffering. He's forbearing. He is a patient God with us who don't deserve it, by the way. But Satan tells us, ah, too late. Too late. Don't even try. I want to tell you there's a message of hope. Joel didn't leave the people of Israel without giving them the whole message. First of all, he told them what they could do to fix the problem. He told them, actually pretty clearly... He said, you can be restored. The verses that we read in chapter number 2, He said, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, 
and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful. You know, it was the custom when people were in mourning in that part of the world and in that day and time, they would put ashes on their head they would wear old rough sackcloth like a, a burlap bag and they would literally tear their clothes showing the, uh, the angst or the sorrow that they were feeling. Joel says, don't rend your garments, rend your heart. Let your heart be broken because you've gotten away from your God and repent and cry out to your God. Because He is gracious and He is merciful. Dear friends, the offer of restoration, that wherever we are along the spectrum and however uh, long we've been gone, He's wanting to receive us back. Just like the prodigal son. And the father waiting in the story of the prodigal son, when he saw his son coming afar off, he didn't wait for his son to get to the porch. The father took off across the field, running to meet his son. So too is God with us. And friend, if you feel like you're away from God, you don't have to stay away from God. God's promise is a promise that He will restore. But I'm afraid there are too many Christians that they're still living with the locusts. I mentioned finances earlier. Every person's in a different situation. By the way, everything the preacher says might not be specifically for you, but it might be for somebody. Unless you think that the preacher is condemning anyone, the preacher is not condemning anyone because, as I've said so many times before, usually the preacher has as many or more rough edges than you do that God is constantly trying to sand off with the coarse sandpaper. But we've all known Christians that were constantly having financial problems. It robs them of their joy. Sometimes it robs them of their sleep. It's a constant source of worry. Sometimes a constant source of conflict in the home. There's always some new expense that seems to come up unexpectedly even when it looks like everything's going to come out right at the end of the month. Always some new expense. They're always coming up short. And yet not everyone is like Job. It's not always, in spite of the fact that we're doing what God wants us to, sometimes it's because Christians aren't doing what they ought to be doing. Malachi, the last prophet of the Old Testament, asked the question, Will a man rob God? And then he answers it. God answers it. God said, Yes, ye have robbed me in tithes and offerings. I've, I'm always amazed when some of those who, who come to the preacher and say we're having financial problems, it seems like we can never make ends meet, are some of the same people who have told me, without the preacher ever asking, that they don't believe in tithing. They don't believe tithing is for the New Testament Christian, it's for believers in the Old Testament under the law. You know... If you're here this morning, this preacher doesn't know what anybody gives in your tithes, your offerings, or anything. I don't know. I don't want to know. But I've literally had Christians, some members of our church, some not members of our church, to tell me face to face, I don't believe in tithing. Or I give my money, instead of putting it in the offering plate, I find people that I know and I give, give my money to them to help them out. Now, 
that's good to do, by the way, to give other people money if they need help. But that doesn't mean we ought not tithe for the upkeep of God's ministry. It doesn't mean we ought not give to missions. It doesn't mean we ought not give to the Lord's work. And I'm always amazed, always amazed when some of the Christians who tell me they're constantly in financial problems or this breaks down or that breaks down or uh, this or that comes up every month and they're the ones that don't, don't give anything. And yet they expect God to do all the giving. And they wonder why there are financial calamities in their lives. Friends, I don't know what any of you give or don't give. So I say what I say this morning to say that some of the plagues of locusts in our lives are plagues we bring upon ourselves. I've known more than a few Christian parents over the last 30 years who bemoan the fact that their children don't share their values now that they're grown. They don't have the same view of God or respect for church, or the Bible, that they seem to allow the world to affect their what they believe about things more than what the Bible says. And yet some of those same parents, if you went back 10 years, 20 years, or more, we would find that they weren't consistent in their own Christian testimonies in front of their children. That they said, this is the most important, but they displayed something different with their actions and the things they did. That they said, this, is my, this, this ought to be our priority as Christians, but then everything else was the priority and the kids are left thinking to themselves, well, I know that God's supposed to be the priority, but why does He always get pushed off to the side? And the children aren't ever going to say that. But there will come a point 10 years, 20 years or further down the line where these parents that you've seen and I've seen scratch their heads and they cry at night and wonder why their children don't share the same values and convictions that they do. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 6 and 7 says that parents ought to ought to teach their children diligently walking by the wayside when they're lying down at night. You and I have seen it. And by the way, it happens when parents do the right thing too. I've known more than a few parents who are the right kind of parents and their children still went the way of the world. Sometimes it's a Job situation, and sometimes it's a me getting in the way situation. Then there are relationships, personal relationships. And over the last 30 years, I've heard a number of different Families talk about relationships. Maybe it was with each other. Maybe it was with a friend. Maybe it was some other relationship. But they would say something like, we don't seem to get along as well as we used to. We seem to be going in different directions nowadays. But I wonder... Was there a place where Christ was replaced at the center of whatever relationship it was? I wonder, was He ever the center of whatever relationship it was? Have you allowed relationships to change who you are as a Christian in a negative way? Our testimonies our priorities, our convictions. Maybe that's the reason the locusts keep showing up in our relationships. I think about entertainment, and entertainment is probably one of the biggest areas of everyone's life today. 
Have you ever seen a Christian that over time it seemed like their values, their outlook on life was more like the world? Things that used to bother them about being wrong it doesn't seem to bother them so much anymore. They've kind of gotten comfortable with it. They've gotten comfortable with the vulgar speech, the innuendo, the crude humor. They've gotten comfortable listening to music, watching things on TV that a Christian really doesn't have any business watching. But everybody else does it. And then eventually those Christians reach a point that they're miserable. Because if they're saved, the Holy Spirit's not going to let them live that way. And they become pessimistic, dark, always negative, maybe depressed. Their mind's always thinking about things that are impure. But Philippians chapter 4 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. We've allowed entertainment to replace what we used to have in our lives with the Word of God. Entertainment affects our Christian lives in other ways. I've seen it. You've seen it. Christians that will show up for church on Sunday, and by the way, the preacher's always glad if they show up. But they'll show up for church and they'll sit there and they'll constantly be nodding off. Or their mind will be a million miles away thinking about their favorite show or what they're going to do tomorrow or what's for lunch. But they've stayed up so late on Saturday they can't get anything out of the message on Sunday. And if we, if we went to work that way on Monday, we'd probably lose our job. Yet we think somehow it's okay to do that in the Lord's house on Sunday morning. But God offers the possibility of taking all of that away that the locusts have eaten The Bible says in Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Dear friends, God is not like Zeus sitting up on Mount Olympus waiting to throw a lightning bolt down. God is not wanting to chasten us. He's not wanting anything in our lives that will hurt us. He loves you. He wants the best for you. And He doesn't want the locusts in your lives, eating and devouring everything that's good. It's simple. If there are things that ought not be there. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In Philippians 3, 13, the Apostle Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Stop letting the devil say, it's too late, you're too far gone, it's been too long, there's no use in trying. Don't buy that. Now I'd like you to see that message of hope at the end. In Joel chapter number 2, Verse 25, the prophet says this, Speaking for God, he says, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I send among you. 
I remember when I first read this verse, and it jumped out at me what God was saying. I was in college at the time. But I remember when I read this verse, and I realized what it was saying. It's got to be one of the greatest truths, one of the greatest promises in the entire Bible. Look at it again with me. Verse 25, Joel 2, verse 25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. Dear friends, Satan says it's too far gone. There's nothing you can have back. You've lost it. All the things you could have had, they're all gone. Friends, that's not what God says. God says that He can restore even the years that the locusts have eaten. Whatever it is that was lost, not only is God willing to to put us on the right path when we come to Him with a clean heart, not only is from here on something good, But whatever you think you lost during all that time you weren't doing what you should have been doing or you were away from God, God says He can restore even the years that the locusts have eaten. He can not only give you all the good stuff He has from this day on, He'll go back and give you the stuff that you didn't get, that you missed along the way because you weren't where He could give it to you. He can even restore the years that the locusts have eaten. My, what a great truth. What a great promise. He's not only a God willing to forgive, but He's a God willing to go back and give us the things we shouldn't have gotten because we missed out on on my account. He's still willing to give it to me. Dear friends, whether you're listening here in person or it's somebody listening online at a later time, if God has taken some things away and allowed the locust to come in in one area or another of your life, just know that if you walk with a clean heart from this day forward, God can not only give you the things that He wants you to have for the rest of your life, Our God is such a great God, He will go back and give you the things that you lost. It might not be exactly the things you think it ought to be, but I promise whatever God has is even better than what you think you lost. Because God is able to restore the years that the locusts have eaten. That's an exciting truth. So if you're here this morning, and you feel like you've messed up in any area of your life. Can I tell you this morning, if your heart is clean before God when you walk out that door, God has promised. He'll not only bless you from this day forward if you walk with Him, but He'll go back and He'll give you the years that the locust have eaten. What a great promise. Would you stand quietly and reverently to your feet with heads bowed and eyes closed? Brother Jim, if you and Miss Mary would come. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you promised not only to forgive us when we're wrong, but Lord, you promised that if we'll walk with you with a sincere and a contrite heart, that Lord, you'll even restore the years that the locusts have eaten. Lord, that's a much better deal than we deserve. You're a great God, a good God, a loving God. Lord, I don't know for who this message, for whom this message is intended. I did not know who would be here today, and I do not know who will listen later on. But I know this message is the message you have for us today. Surely there must be something in the message for all of us. Lord, help us to take those things that are for us, to apply them to our lives, and allow you to change us and make us what you want us to be. 
Dear Lord, I love our folks. I know some of our folks are hurting. Oh, dear God, I pray you'd bind up the wounds. Heal our hurts. Some are just like Job, Lord. They've sincerely been trying to do right. And still, testings, temptations, and trials come. Help them, Lord. Help them to keep the course. To stay faithful. That others will see their testimonies and do the same. And Lord, if there are those who have experienced the locust because of their own doing, then dear God, I pray too that they would come back to You today and that even the years the locust have eaten or the days, the weeks, or the months would be restored to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.